Hello everyone. Welcome to this RSET webinar on mapping and monitoring lakes and reservoirs with satellite observations. My name is Amita Mehta and I will be conducting this training with my colleague Sean McCartney. Overall training objectives are listed here. We will learn to identify the remote sensing data and methodologies re relevant for obtaining surface water extent, water level height, and bathymetry for lakes and reservoirs. We will also learn to access water extent, water level height, and bathymetry data for monitoring lakes and reservoirs. And we will understand the use of lake level and bathymetry data for a variety of applications. As shown here, there will be three sessions. And today we'll have introduction of remote sensing observations for monitoring water extent, water level height, and bathymetry in lakes and reservoirs. We will focus then on uh, water extent data and how to get this data. Okay. Next session, we'll focus on getting water level height for lakes and reservoirs using radar altimetry. And the final session will focus on getting water level height and bathymetry from laser altimetry. So there will be three sessions, each one one and a half hour long. That includes question and answer. And each session will be repeated twice. So this session will also be offered this afternoon. Here's the website for this webinar on um, RSET website, where you can um, access all the training materials and recordings also will be posted here. There will be one homework assignment that will be posted on RSET website, webinar website, uh, in, via Google form. And that will be posted on the last day of this webinar. So that is 23rd of February. And the homework will be due a month from then on 23rd of March. Our certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. And then a certificate uh, of completion will be awarded two months after the completion of the course and it will be um, sent by Marina Smartens. There is a prerequisite for this webinar, and that is Fundamentals of Remote Sensing that describes um, just basic concept about satellites, orbits, data levels, etc. So if you haven't um, gone through this webinar, we recommend that you uh, go, uh, to listen to this webinar and learn about some of those uh, jargon. Um, here is the link for this uh, fundamental of remote sensing webinar. With that, this is the uh, overall outline for today. We'll start with an introduction to our set program. Then we will have basic information about lakes and reservoirs and why they are important. Then we'll move on to satellites and sensors for monitoring lakes and reservoirs. Then we will focus on global surface water data sets. We will have examples of monitoring lakes and reservoirs. And then finally, Sean McCartney will have a demonstration of global surface water data access. So we'll start with um, introduction to RSET. Those of you who have not taken RSET trainings before, RSET program or Applied Remote Sensing Training Program is part of NASA's Applied Sciences Capacity Building Program and it is designed to empower the global community through online and in-person remote sensing trainings. The trainings are offered in these four thematic areas shown here. It's water resources, air quality, land, and disaster. RSET's goal is to increase the use of earth science in decision-making through training for professionals in the public and private sector, environmental managers and policy makers. All the material that we present, this training and other trainings are all available from our set website and they're freely available to use and adapt for your own use. 
Only thing we request is that if you use any methods or data presented in our set trainings, then please acknowledge NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. Here is an overall performance of RSET since 2009. And as you can see, uh, the bubbles show uh, size of corresponding number of participants. And as you can see, since 2009, uh, participation has grown in RSET trainings in all thematic areas. Um, if we have conducted 140 plus trainings and um, covering more than 9,000 organizations and including 170 plus countries and total participation is more than 40,000 uh, participants. With that, we will have information about lakes and reservoirs. So a lake is a natural body where surface water runoff and groundwater seepage accumulate in a location due to surrounding terrain and slope. And the example is shown here, uh, Walker Lake, Alaska. This is a natural lake. Whereas a reservoir is an artificial lake, a man-made lake that is created by either building a dam on a river or excavating land or by building dikes around land to hold water. So that's an artificial lake. And the example here is in Washington State, Franklin Roosevelt Reservoir. You can also see this dam uh, which uh, was built to make this reservoir. Lakes and reservoirs are important because they are components of surface water and they play a significant role in regional and global hydrological and biogeochemical cycles. They provide water for domestic agricultural and industrial usage and in many cases uh, provide hydropower generation capability. They also provide water for cooling uh, power plants. Man-made reservoirs additionally are used for water storage and flood control. They can be used for fishing and recreational activities. They support a wide variety of aquatic ecosystems and wildlife and they're valued for their aesthetic and scenic qualities. So they make great tourist destinations and then help local economy also. The example shown here is in Great Lake area. This is the Great Lake St. Lawrence River Basin area that supports about 36 million people and daily withdrawal of water that varies between 43 to 44 million gallons. This panel describes what different usage of this water are in this area. But most important thing to note here is that it is used primarily for by power sector. So uh, water, uh, uh, lakes and reservoirs, important not only just for water resources, but also for energy sector, they are quite important also. According to USGS, about 21% of global fresh water is stored in global lakes and reservoirs. There are two interesting studies. They uh, provide information about where um, the situation is currently with respect to global lakes and reservoirs. Um, these uh, references are given at the end of this um, presentation. So Mayor et al. They show uh, that between 1995 and 2015, globally, um, there have been about 1.42 million lakes and reservoirs of at least 10 hectares in size or bigger. And as you can see in this uh, figure, uh, these dots, they show uh, lakes, uh, distribution of lakes and reservoirs over the globe. Uh, you can notice that in Northern Hemisphere, higher latitude, there are quite a few lakes that you can see in here. The second study by Pickel et al. That shows uh, that between 1984 and 2015, um, there, there were permanent water bodies, they disappeared. So about 90,000 kilometers uh, area 
was lost, a permanent water body were lost. But at the same time, new reservoirs were created and permanent bodies of surface water covering about 184 kilometers square was added during this period. By the way, this study is based on remote sensing observations and it is shown here. Uh, this shows permanent water uh, and with latitude and longitude, these lines, red lines, show um, disappearance of permanent water and the green lines, they show um, addition of uh, new reservoirs of permanent water. So we know that there are so many lakes and reservoirs, so how are they sustained? And also know that they are important for water resources and energy sector. So it is important to uh, understand how they are sustained. And for that, it is important to know what water volume is in each of these lakes and reservoirs. And so for uh, understanding how water volume changes in lakes and reservoirs, um, there are inflows and outflows that we have to understand. So water inflow sources, they include rainfall and runoff via streams and rivers and groundwater seepage into water bodies as shown here. So it's precipitation, there could be streams bringing in uh, water and also there is groundwater seepage. Natural outflow of water from lakes can be also via streams uh, can go out, water can go out and there could be loss of water to atmosphere through evaporation and through uh, subsurface and uh, groundwater, there could be uh, water percolation in there too from water bodies. So these are outflow components. Withdrawal of water for human needs also contributes to outflow. And so it is the inflow and outflow that decides um, what uh, water volume will be at any given time in lakes and reservoirs. If the reser uh, reservoirs, which are man-made, uh, inflow and outflow can somewhat be controlled and can be uh, maintained. Uh, lakes, on the other hand, they are dependent completely on natural processes. So water volume or storage in lakes and reservoirs, it's influenced by watershed processes such as precipitation, topography, soil and vegetation cover, runoff, population density and water consumption. Also, climate variability and change which influence precipitation and other um, parameters such as soil moisture, vegetation, uh, etc. Also, land use and land use change, water demands, they all impact both inflow and out outflow uh, and influence volume of lakes and reservoirs. Sediments brought in uh, by rivers and streams to lakes and reservoirs can alter their physical and chemical characteristics. And so over time, that is how uh, lake extent and depth they can change, so volume can change. Both horizontal extent and water depth of lakes then are influenced by all these factors. So for sustainable and efficient water resources and ecosystem management, monitoring lakes and reservoirs, especially their area and depth, they're very important. Also note that um, water quality management is also an integral part of lake and reservoir management, but that's a whole new topic and um, we will not be uh, considering that in this webinar. We will focus on uh, data sets that help in estimating uh, water quantity, so that is um, area, depth, and water volume. That's what we will be focusing on. So here is an example of how water volume can be estimated. What is needed is average lake area multiplied by average depth of that lake or water body. An example is shown here and this is bathymetry map for Lake Erie and Lake St. Clair. So bathymetry, it describes bottom topography or depth within the lake. And as you can see, uh, on any water body, it varies. 
So uh, distance or depth to uh, bottom is low here and it's high over here. So it varies over the lake. But for approximate approximation, one can have um, approximate area based on shoreline length, so width and length, uh, and uh, have bathymetry information or depth information of lake and calculate volume of that lake. And then in addition, when you have information about water level height within that lake, multiplying lake area by that water level uh, depth or water level height gives volume of water in that particular lake. So this is how uh, water volume can be estimated if we know uh, these two parameters. Now, um, we just talked about globally there are more than 1.42 million lakes and reservoirs. It is impossible to have in situ data measuring uh, lake area or uh, water level depth in all these lakes. So that's why remote sensing is useful for monitoring lakes and reservoirs and there is one example shown here from Landsat satellite. So first of all satellite remote sensing it provides global timely and consistent observations and what is shown here is um, in Mongolia uh, all these uh, lakes are uh, changing the extent of lake is changing and so that is shown here um, so that remote sensing can do that because it's consistently observing this entire area and also there is a long time series of uh, water extent so surface water area water level and bathymetry so that way it helps in monitoring lakes over time and see how things are changing one example specific lake is shown here. This is um, Lake uh, Shinkai uh, in uh, Mongolia again. And you can see that between 2001, 4 and 6, this lake is getting sedimented. And by 2006, you can hardly see any water in here. So satellite data that way are useful in monitoring surface extent of water and then as we will see later we can also have water level and bathymetry information. So this brings us to our main part of our webinar. So we satellites and sensors for monitoring lakes and reservoirs. So here is a summary of all the satellites and sensors which help in monitoring or measuring these various lake parameters. Um, last column also shows what kind of measurements are taken by this sensor. So let's start with um, surface water extent. Uh, you can see that uh, there are multiple satellites that provide this information. Current satellites include Terra and Aqua and Landsat 7 and 8. There is also um, past data from Landsat series, so Landsat 5 is there too. And the sensors in, on these satellites are MODIS on Terra and Aqua, which is moderate resolution imaging spectral radiometer. And on Landsat 7, it is Enhanced Thematic Mapper Plus. On Landsat 8, is it Operational Land Imager. And on Landsat 5, is a thematic mapper and multi-spectral scanner. All these sensors are actually optical instruments. They take reflectance measurements uh, reflected from surface in visible infrared, uh, near infrared, and uh, shortwave infrared region uh, of electromagnetic spectrum. Lake level height, they're measured by two current satellites, JSON 2 and 3, but there is a long historical time series of um, lake level height also, and they are measured by using microwave radar altimeter. They use C-band and KU-band frequencies in these radar. We will see about these two satellites in next webinar. Lake level height and bathymetry, uh, they're also available from laser altimetry. Uh, so there is a satellite, um, Ice Clouds and Land Elevation Satellite, or ICET-2, that carries an advanced 
Topographic Laser Altimeter, ATLAS, and that helps in measuring these parameters. Finally, Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, which provides digital elevation or topography information, which is also a radar, uh, C-band SAR or synthetic aperture radar, that provides information about uh, lake polygons based on terrain and slope. So as again shown here, these satellites and sensors, um, RSAT has fundamentals of remote sensing webinar part 2b, which describes um, Terra and Aqua, Landsat and SRTM in detail. So we recommend that you review that for more information. Um, in week two, we will talk about JSON 2 and 3, and week three, we'll talk about ISAT 2. But for now, let's just look at what kind of special and temporal coverage and resolutions are available from um, these data sets for uh, lake parameters. So. MODIS uh, provides horizontal surface water extent at 250 meters, and it's a long time series between two satellites. It starts in December 99 and it, it continues now, it's current. Uh, Landsat 7 and 8, so 5, 7, and 8 provide a long time series, and the resolution here is 30 meter. Again, it provides information about horizontal water extent, so you can look at water body area for, from that. Lake level height information from JSON are available uh, so that lakes which are bigger than 100 kilometers square are observed. Um, JSON 2 was launched in June 2008 and then JSON 3 in 2016 and they both are continuing. So every 10 and 35 days respectively, uh, these satellites provide lake level height information for relatively large lakes. ISAT was launched recently in September 2018. It, has, it is continuing now. It provides higher resolution information about lake level height and bathymetry at 0.1 kilometers square. Um, the repeat time here is about 91 days. And um, Lake polygons from SRTM, they are available at 30 meters. Um, this was uh, flying on Space Shuttle in 2000, so uh, this is the static data set. So that brings us to global surface water data sets. We talked about importance of lakes and how to get lake volume for that. One thing we need is surface area or horizontal extent of lakes and reservoirs. So that is what we're going to talk about today. Height and bathymetry also needed for uh, getting water volume. We'll talk about that in week two and three. So let's start with uh, global um, water surface data. So these are global lake polygons from SRTM um, and other um, supporting data. They are called hydro lakes and more information can be found here in this link. So hydro lakes database provides shoreline polygons of global lakes of 10 hectares and larger. There are more than 1.4 million lakes both saline and freshwater. They are included in this database. So again both natural and man-made reservoirs are seen through this. Uh, based on several near global and regional data sets combined, there is a near global coverage. Um, so here is a list of all other data sets or total data sets used to look at all these number of lakes. So in addition to SRTM, which is between 56 south to 60 north, you also have Canadian hydrographic data sets. Uh, MODIS uh, also is used, MODIS surface extent is used to aid in northern uh, latitudes. Uh, then U.S. national hydrography data sets, European uh, data set, also global lakes and wetland database, and global reservoir and dam, dam database. These are all used to uh, map uh, lake polygons as shown here. These 
polygons can be obtained uh, from this HydroShed uh, website. And RSET also had conducted a webinar last year on using HydroShed's. So this specifically is for uh, lake polygons. And if you go to this website, you can pick a region and select lakes and download uh, lake polygons and lake four points in either ESRI uh, geodatabase or as shapefiles. The second uh, data set is from MODIS. It is MODIS water mask data or MOD 44W is the product identification number and this is version 6. So this product is based on um, SRTM water body data set so it uses that hydro lakes polygons and modis reflectances that is between 45 south and um, 60 north these two are used to uh, derive water mask modis alone is used between 60 to 90 north latitudes and mosaic of antarctica product is used between 60 south and 90 south Every 16 day MODIS overpass, it's a revisit time for MODIS that's used to derive water mask. And then based on that, global annual water body mask is derived at 250 meter resolution. Currently, um, this water mask is available annually for uh, 2000 to 2015. Also, SRTM, um, digital elevation model, at 30 meter is used to improve this by by correcting for terrain shadows and so so they're not misinterpreted as uh, water bodies also modis burnt area uh, product also is used to delineate burn scars so again um, not to misinterpret them as uh, water bodies and technical details can be found from this document here to obtain uh, MOD44 water data, uh, here is the website. It is application for exchange and exploring analysis ready samples or appears. This is from um, land processing DAC from USGS. And RSET had conducted a webinar. There's information on how to use appears to get data, but it's a versatile web-based tool where you can uh, have temporal selection, uh, you can have product selection. So in here, you would enter mod 44W. Also, there is special selection through either uh, drawing a polygon or if you have a shape file of the area of your interest, you can upload that and uh, have select data for that region. Also, there is a facility that you can download this data in multiple formats, so in GeoTIFF, um, or you can have a NetCDF format also. So this is um, one way of getting MOD 44W data for water mask. Those of you who are familiar with Google Earth Engine can use that to get this data set also. So MODIS water mask can also be obtained by using GEE. Again, the link and the data information they are provided here. So this brings us to our final um, surface water data set derived from Landsat. That is JRC Global Surface Water. That is developed by European Commission's Joint Research Center, that is GRC. It uses uh, Landsat from Landsat 5, 7, and 8 imagery. And the water detection is based on multispectral features using big data techniques such as expert supervision, technique, visual analytics, and evidential reasoning. Again, Pickle et al. Uh, paper describes detail of how um, this surface water is derived from Landsat data. These data sets are available uh, from multiple sites. Google Earth Engine uh, has this data set. Um, and also, if anyone is interested in using this algorithm, then uh, permission 
is needed, but that um, is also available in Google Earth Engine. And here it just shows geographical and temporal coverage of the events at 5, 7, and 8 on the archive between uh, 1984 and 2015. So um, as you can see, uh, there is global coverage um, at 30 meter resolution surface water data are available currently uh, from 1984 to 2009. And there is a dedicated uh, website, Global Surface Water Explorer, that provides um, not only uh, sea, uh, annual water um, information, but also seasonal uh, information is there too. Google Earth Engine also has um, JRC Global Surface Water Data available. And through uh, GEE, um, there are a number of parameters available. So the frequency with which water was present, then absolute change in occurrence between two ep epochs, so 1984 to 1999 and 2000 to 2019. Between these two periods, how uh, water bodies changed, you can see from that. Normalized change uh, uh, in occurrence, so this is normalized. Uh, number of months water is present, the frequency with which water returns from year to year, categorical classification of change between first and last year, and there's also a binary image containing uh, one where uh, there is water present or what, where water was detected. So this is a um, global long-term useful data set, relatively high resolution, 30 meters, uh, that can help in monitoring leaks and reservoirs. So finally, we have a couple of examples of how uh, these data set can be used in monitoring leaks and reservoirs. So one study is by Busker et al. Uh, this paper shows that uses this JRC surface water and altimeter-based lake level heights, which we're going to talk about next week for monitoring lake volume and change in lake volumes between 1984 and 2015. And here the figure is showing that change between 1984 to 2015 in various lakes, how volume has changed uh, over years. So this is decrease in volume, this is increase in volume. Also notice that um, these show um, whether the area was constant or um, area was changing. So these are different categories shown. Lake volume would depend on two things, uh, surface extent and also depth or lake level height. So they both can change independently or together and affect lake volume. And so this is what is shown by these different symbols. Uh, so, for example, here the surface extent has not changed, but depth must have changed because volume has changed. So, as you can see, for many reservoirs, uh, water volume has changed over years. Next study by Lou et al. Uh, focuses on Caspian Sea. This also uh, provides um, water volume, also provides lake area and lake level height. Again, uh, you can see that this is monthly data and this is annual data. Um, it's from 85 to 2017. And clearly you can see that both area and um, water level height, they're decreasing uh, in last several years and that is affecting volume of water in Caspian Sea. So again, you can see that for last several years there is decreasing water volume trend in Caspian Sea. So these data sets uh, can help in monitoring a, a particular lake or reservoir and see how things are changing. Is surface extent changing, uh, lake level is changing, or both are changing? That is what um, it helps us figure out. So with that, um, I want to request Sean McCartney to show us how to uh, access JRC Global Surface Water Data, and he's going to demonstrate that. So, Sean, take away. Thank you.
Thank you, Amita. The following are two demonstrations on how to access global surface water data from the Joint Research Center. Before I discuss the data sets and tools used to explore them, I'd like to acknowledge the European Commission's Joint Research Center, or JRC, as it's known by its acronym. The Joint Research Center is the European Commission's Science and Knowledge Service, which employs scientists to carry out research in order to provide independent scientific advice and support to European Union policy. To produce the global surface water product, scientists at JRC use the entire archive of Landsat 5 Thematic Mapper, the Landsat 7 Enhanced Thematic Mapper Plus, and the Landsat 8 Operational Land Imager, imager constituting millions of Landsat scenes from the past 36 years to document surface water location and seasonality across the planet. Their goal was to map the spatial and temporal variability of global surface water and its long-term changes. The following demos will show you how to interact with the JRC's global surface water mapping layers. Google Earth Engine will be used in the first demo to access and explore JRC's global surface water mapping layers. Earth Engine is a platform for scientific analysis and visualization of geospatial data sets. Earth Engine hosts satellite imagery and stores it in a pub public data archive that includes historical Earth images going back more than 40 years. Earth Engine also provides APIs and other tools to enable the analysis of large data sets. For the demo, we'll be focusing on Itaipu Reservoir in South America as our study area. Itaipu Dam is a hydroelectric dam on the Parana River located on the border between Brazil and Paraguay. The dam was completed in 1984 and produced the second most energy of any dam in the world as of 2020, only surpassed by the Three Gorges Dam in China in energy production. The code used in this demo is freely available from the Google Earth Engine repository found in the link below. To gain access to Earth Engine, you will need to sign up, sign up for an account. Earth Engine is free for research, education, and nonprofit use. When you open Earth Engine from the link to the shared repository, you should see something similar to the layout on my screen. On the far left of the screen is the scripts manager where you can create your own repositories and scripts and add those that are shared or publicly available. The shared script for this demo should appear under the reader dropdown on your account. It is under the owner dropdown on my account since I created the code. When you click on the JRC Global Surface Water Mapping, you should see it open in your code editor. I'm going to walk you quickly through the code so you can understand its functionality. At the top of the code editor are links to learn more about the datasets. The four lines under the asset list define variables for the global surface water version 1.2. The first statement references the Earth Engine image object for the global surface water dataset and stores it in a variable named GSW or global surface water. The second, third, and fourth statements define variables for individual layers within the global surface water dataset. Occurrence is the frequency with which water was present from 1984 to 2019 from 0 to 100%. Absolute change shows changes in occurrence between two epochs, 1984 to 1999 versus 2000 to 2019. Transition shows the categorical classification of change between the first and last year. Depending on which layers in the global surface water data set you're interested in, you can adapt to this code appropriately. I'm going to go ahead and click Run so this will make a little bit more sense. 
When I do click Run, you can see that the next chunk of code centered the map on a geographic location, in this case being the Itaipu Reservoir, and it defined the zoom extent for the map. You will need to change the coordinates and the zoom extent for your own region of interest. The lines of code under Map Symbology define the visibility parameters and colors for the maps when they're displayed in the map pane. We will use these variables when adding layers to the map. The next chunk of code specifies the position and the symbology of the map legend. In this demo, I created a legend for the water transitions layer, but you should adapt this code to whatever layer you want represented in a legend on your map. Under the calculation section, the first variable, water underscore mask, is defined to create a water mask derived from the occurrence layer. Any pixels greater than 90% occurrence from 1984 to 2019 will be labeled as water, and everything else will be masked out. The next section of code creates a histogram from an image, in this case the absolute change image and prints it to the console. You can adapt this code to generate a histogram from any other layer that you're interested in. The area defined for generating the histogram was created from the geometry tools to generate a region of interest, or ROI, that you need, you need to do the following. First, we're going to go to the Draw a Shapes polygon and click on it. And then we're going to go to an area of interest, and we're going to create that polygon around it. So let's say my area of interest is along this river. What I will do is I will click, left click once for each node, and then I'll double click to complete the polygon. Then we'll go to the geometry, uh, and then we will click on the spin wheel. And then we'll need to rename this geometry as ROI and define that variable because that is what the variable is defined as in the code to be able to make the code run. I'm going to go ahead and delete this because we don't need it. As you can see, I've already created an ROI, which is located just underneath Lake Itaipu. Once the code runs, the histogram will be printed to the console tab. The next lines of code create a two-band image where the first band contains the area information in units of square meters, and the second band contains the transition class we defined as a variable earlier in the code. We then summarize the class transitions within the region of interest, or ROI, which we defined already. We then use the reducer method and a grouped reducer, which acts to sum up the area within each transition class. As a reminder what each transaction class is, they are found in the map legend under after running the code. The results of summing each transition class are then printed to the console tab. You will have to click on the drop-down arrows to see the sum of square meters for each transition class along with the associated transition class value. Under the Map Layers section, the next lines of code add layers to the map window, defining which layers to add, the symbology for each layer which we defined above, followed by the name where we are assigning to each layer in the map window, and finally, whether the layer will, dis will dis display by default. If we have show false, then the map layer will not display by default. But as you can see for the, uh, for the occurrence layer, I did not uh, specify that. So there it, de it displayed. The last lines of code provide the option of downloading specified bands within the region of interest to your Google Drive as a GeoTIFF file. You can adapt the code to download whatever bands you want. 
To download the GeoTIFF file, you have to click on the file under the Tasks tab to open it in the Google Drive. We also are providing the option to generate a download link if you don't want to save the file to your Google Drive. The download link, once uncommented, will appear under the console tab below the, uh, the reductions results. Now that we've figured all this out, we can go and we can start looking at uh, some of the other layers by turning them on and off. And for this case, we're looking at the transitions layer, which I just uh, turned on. So these are all the transitions between 1984 and 2019. We can zoom into a part of the map and we can start looking at where these transitions took place. And again, a legend was provided to be able to um, view those within the map window. In the second demo, we'll showcase the web tool Global Surface Water Explorer created by the European Commission's Joint Research Center developed in the framework of the Copernicus program. The web tool maps the location and temporal distribution of water surfaces at the global scale over the past 36 years and provides statistics on the extent and change of those water surfaces. We will use Lake Winnebago in the U.S. state of Wisconsin as our study area, but we'll also use the web tool to explore other parts of the planet as well. Lake Winnebago is a shallow freshwater lake in east central Wisconsin. At 137,700 acres, it is the largest lake entirely within the state. You can launch JRC's Global Surface Water Explorer using the link provided below. Upon launching the Global Surface Water Explorer, you can search for a region of interest by typing a location in the search box located in the upper left portion of the window, or exploring some of the water bodies provided at the bottom of the page. By clicking on the RLC at the bottom of the screen, the map window zooms into this inland sea located in Central Asia. On the right side of the screen is the Layers panel, where we can select from six different layers. Currently, Water Occurrence is turned on, but we can also turn on Water Occurrence Change Intensity, where values represented in red have shown a decrease from between 1984 and 1999 to 2000 to 2019. Areas in black showed no change over this, these two epochs, and areas in green showed an increase in surface water between 1984 and 1999 versus 2000 and 2019. We also have water seasonality. There's a layer for annual water occurrence. There's also a layer for water transitions, which we demonstrated in Google Earth Engine. And finally, we have maximum water extent over the entire period from 1984 to 2019. If you're ever curious what any of these layers do, you can hover your cursor over the information icon and it will give you more information on each of these layers. There's also the uh, option to run a Earth time lapse. This shows from 1984 to 2016 in this case, uh, an annual time step of surface water for this specific area of interest. You also have an option, a number of options for background layers. I'm going to leave it as satellite because I tend to uh, like this as a, uh, a background layer for the map. There's also a, uh, a comment that pops up letting you know about this study area. We, let's now type in Lake Winnebago. And as we type it in and click enter, we can see that the map is now panning to this uh, region of interest. We'll give it another sec, sometimes it takes a couple seconds to redraw. There we go. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. 
As we mentioned earlier, Lake Winnebago is the largest lake found within entirely within the state of Wisconsin, but there are also a number of much smaller lakes uh, in this area as well. So let's zoom into one of the lakes where, again, the water occurrence layer is currently turned on. And this is showing water occurrence from 0 to 100% uh, occurrence from 1984 to 2019. If we click on any one individual pixel that we're interested in, we can see that two different uh, graphs appear. The top graph shows the monthly water occurrence data set, providing information on the intra-annual distribution of the water and characterizes seasonality. Its main purpose is to see how water distribution varies over the year for a particular place. When we hover our mouse over the uh, gray bar, we can see that for the month of March, there were 82 observations and there were nine valid observations. Valid observations being, for this pixel, they were cloud-free. We can also go to other gray bars for the month of April, and we can see that there were 78 total observations and 37 uh, valid observations, so again, being cloud-free. When we hover the cursor over the blue bar, we can see that for the month of April, there was surface water 85% of the time for this specific pixel. We can also see that due to seasonality, for each intra-annual month, we can see that the uh, month of August for this specific pixel showed only a 29% occurrence of surface water throughout the entire 1984 to 2019. In the bottom graph, the yearly water history provides information on the seasonality of water over the 36 year period. It contains the same information as the seasonality data set, but for every year where observations are available within the period 1984 to 2019. When we hover the cursor over, say, 1984, we can see that, yes, there was permanent water throughout this year uh, for, at this pixel. When we go to 1987, we can see that it was seasonal water, so it was not there for the entire year. When we jump ahead to starting in 2009, we can see that for this pixel, there was no water. And as we can see going forward for the, this current decade, actually the decade we just left, that most of the years there was no water for that pixel. So to investigate a little bit more, let's turn off this layer and let's go to the, um, let's go to the water occurrence. And just as a, a trick, in the upper right corner of the layers panel, you can uh, click that and you can make that layers panel go away. So we can see that for, from 1984 to 2019, there has been an overall decrease in water for this specific area. So data for each of the layers are available to download in a 10 degree by 10 degree tile, tile from the Joint Research Center. They can also be downloaded uh, as shown previously using Google Earth Engine. <clears throat> so this concludes the demonstrations on global surface water data access. For many of the topics and tools covered in today's presentation, we've included a reference slide for further reading. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's training. We've been receiving a lot of good questions from many of you, and feel free to post a question in the question and answer box, and we'll get to them in the order they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. Below is the contact information for Amit and me, along with the training webpage and the training website. Great, thank you everybody. And we're getting some really great questions, so please feel free to, uh, to, to drop them into the, the Q&A box. And again, we will answer them in the order that they are received. So question number one, can Sentinel-2 data also be used to analyze surface water extent? Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, the 
similar bands that are on the uh, similar optical bands that are on uh, Landsat uh, missions are also on the, uh, the Sentinel-2 satellite. And so it's very common to use uh, some of the indexes such as green and near infrared is also uh, uh, near infrared and shortwave infrared. And they're used, uh, commonly used uh, wavelengths to create the normalized difference water index. And so we left a, a reference there for you to read more about using Sentinel-2 uh, to be able to uh, generate surface water extent using this satellite and instrument. I should say satellites and instrument. Now question two, are there similar databases with polygons and bathymetry for large rivers? So Amita had referenced uh, the Hydrosheds website earlier in this presentation, and that same website can also be used to, uh, to find polygons uh, for, for large rivers. If there's actually a global river database of polygons that was derived from the shuttle radar topography mission uh, that was flown a couple decades ago. And we left a web, uh, link to that website, so you can go there and, and download uh, any region of interest that you had on the planet uh, in, in polygon format. Also, Question if I three. may add, I'm yes, sorry. Please. Yeah, just wanted to add that um, NASA is also working on a global water monitor, which will include uh, reverse also, and that's coming later this year. We will talk about that in the last session of this webinar. But yes, so um, polygons are available from uh, hydro sheds, and then um, volume of water will also be available at that point. Great. Thank you so much for that, Amita. Question number three, I do not understand what is the meaning of a water mask. So in its simplest terms, a water mask is a file, usually a raster file, where areas bounded by surface water are assigned a value. And that, tip, that value is typically assigned a value of one, and everything else is assigned a value of zero. Uh, sometimes you might have to reclassify other uh, land cover types and reassign them the value of zero. But what you're ultimately trying to do is create a binary, binary file where all surface water or whatever it is that you're trying to mask, in this case, it is surface water, would be assigned that value of one and everything else would be assigned a value of zero. And this just aids for both visual, visualizing and analyzing uh, the data set. So question number four. Hi, why is the Mod 44W product only provided every 16 days if MODIS has daily temporal resolution? And that is a great question. Uh, MODIS does have daily temporal resolution, and it has to do with how the quality of the products are generated. Uh, the surface water product is derived also from the vegetation products, which are also 16 days. And that has to do with the compositing method of really uh, aggregating the uh, a product's quality assurance metrics to remove any low quality pixels. Low quality pixels could be, uh, you know, for cloud cover, for example, uh, and, and for other noise that could be generated when the satellite passes overhead. So by compositing those pixels and taking the best ones uh, from the remaining good quality pixels, then a constrained view angle approach then is uh, added and selecting only the pixels that represent, uh, a selected pixel to represent the compositing period. And so that's why to produce the highest level of quality assurance, and to provide the best uh, product to, to users. Uh, that's why they aggregate it to a 16-day product and not a daily product. And we've provided a link to the, uh, to the uh, user's guide. So hopefully you will be able to access that as well. So question number five, why do you not talk about the European Union Copernicus program and the Sentinel satellite family? Of course, it is a NASA training program, but is this enough to be silent about free data with a high temporal and spatial resolution? Example given compared to Landsat. Uh, and the answer is uh, yes, you are absolutely correct. Uh, we will be mentioning that in our last session. And next week also uh, you will see European Union satellites used for lake level height uh, for time series. And I will go on to say that we are uh, certainly uh, champions 
of the, the Sentinels, and we do feature them a lot in the RSET trainings. So even though you did not hear about it in this specific uh, presentation, we will be, uh, again, following up in, within this webinar series to highlight some of those missions uh, within the Sentinels. Uh, and, and we are, are, are big proponents of using those data sets for analysis. So question number six, can we download seasonal water body extent in shapefile format? I am not aware of a product that is available seasonally. What you could do if you wanted to um, is you could download a raster file, a seasonal raster file, and if it were just, say, complete extent, and if it weren't for the, uh, say, a percentage of uh, surface water, but if you wanted the maximum extent, let's say, of a specific season, you could download that as a product, as a, as a, a full extent raster product, and then convert that into a shapefile. But I am not aware of a seasonal water body uh, that is available in shapefile format. And we will, if we do come, if we, if we, uh, we come up with one, if we find one, we will certainly add a link to that when we post this to our, our website. So moving on, question number seven, what is a burn scar? Good question. A burn scar is the, uh, the definition that we're fighting here is a visibly blackened land surface left after fires burn vegetation and leaf litter. So hopefully that answers uh, specifically to that question. Uh, question eight, in the introduction part, you defined natural lakes and reservoirs. By this definition, uh, quarry uh, lakes and pit lakes would be reservoirs. This is correct. And answer eight, yes, we use the definition that any lake that is man-made is a reservoir. And we'll also add that the global surface water product that we featured, uh, the, both the, the web app as well as the Earth Engine, they also include any uh, uh, quarry lakes and pit lakes uh, also defined uh, and use that within, uh, within the data sets they provide for global surface water. But great question, because uh, that can be somewhat confusing. So question nine, what happens if you define two ROIs? Which uh, region of interest, ROI, which region of interest or ROI does the code take into account? So in theory, you can provide as many region of interests as you want. Uh, what you would have to do when you run the code is whatever, when you rename the ROI and you give it a, a definite variable name and you define that variable name, you just need to be sure to use that variable name when you run the code. But in theory, you can have, you can generate as many ROIs as you want. You just be, need to be as specific as possible uh, when you run the code to add that variable name uh, into where that block of code should go. Question 10. Are you aware of any Python scripts for the same process? Well, in theory, Earth Engine uh, can run on a Python API. So that is possible. Uh, in, in, in all the examples today, we use JavaScript, which is the common way to uh, in, interact uh, with the uh, Earth Engine API. But if you are savvy enough, and there is a learning curve involved in using a Python API with Earth Engine, but that is possible. So if that is your preferred coding language, then I, I would recommend to look into that. Um, and then you could uh, replicate the similar methodologies that we uh, presented today, but using Python. So question 11, does this data have high enough temporal resolution to detect, to detect changes in the timing of seasonal water? For example, do the shoulder seasons extend over the spring and fall. Thanks. And uh, I, it looks like Amita is typing the answer to this, so uh, I will let her yeah. unmute and answer. Yeah, so, um, so lens data set, temporally, each lens set has 16-day revisit time. So if you take seven and eight, they will have more images per month. So uh, if you take three month season, you will have um, multiple images, but then again, you're right that if it's cloudy, then you're missing um, observations. So that is a drawback. So you are, whatever is available, 
uh, you are using for the season. So that has to be kind of assessed um, in, in your own water body, how, how uh, well it is represented, the seasonal uh, changes. And also, um, so, so that's one thing. Another thing is if it is icy or you know, if it's frozen, then also uh, there may be some issues. So, that, so there are some limitations, but overall, um, annually, if you see this, you will have a good information about water accent. And seasonally, um, I think it, it, it would be interesting to check, you know, with your own interest or in the water body of your own interest, how do these changes match what the satellites are showing. Great, thank you, Amita. So question number 12, can we get these maps in raster format too? How could we export the result maps for other uses. So the examples that we provided today in, in the Surface Water Explorer, as well as in Earth Engine, are all provided in raster format. So we gave examples at the end of the code in Earth Engine. There were two sections for uh, that were blocked uh, commented code that you can uncomment and you can specify what bands that you want to export. And you can export that directly to your drive if you have a Google Drive, or we also provided code that would allow you to download the file, the raster file, as a link. So a link would be generated and it would be a download link. And then you could bring that into whatever, uh, say desktop GIS, if it's uh, QGIS, ArcGIS, et cetera. And that would be one way. And the other thing we will do is for the Surface Water Explorer, uh, the JRC, the Joint Research Center, also provides a website where the same files that we, we showed in both the Explorer as well as an Earth Engine, they provide a website themselves where you can download these raster files uh, based on your study area. And what we will do is provide that link in this answer sheet before we upload it for you. So definitely come back to this and, and that link will be there for you. Uh, but it's a great question, and it's certainly a lot of you are probably wanting to get this data to do further analysis, say, on your own, uh, say, desktop, GIS, et cetera. So, so question also, third. Yes, please, Amita. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. But you finish what you were saying. Were you oh, saying that something? was it. Yeah. So, no, I just want to add that MODIS uh, water mask also is available in, in raster form that you can download from up here. Um, it's 250 meters, but um, it's available annually. Great, thank you. Uh, question 13. How do you take into account seasonality in spectral imagery? So Wait, if we're, uh, yeah, please, Samita. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Sean, if you're. Yeah, so um, in, in spectral imagery, um, first of all, there is a uh, so specific technique. We will have to um, uh, you can uh, look at the technical document and papers. But um, usually, uh, it is through uh, whatever atmospheric correction is done. Um, for that, you do have information about surface temperature, humidity, um, and other constituents. So those are taken care um, when reflectances are derived. Uh, so uh, for for each for each uh, image, when the when the when the data reflectance data are prepared, it uses some atmospheric information that kind of aids that. And so that way, it is taken care of in seasonality. But exact details, you can look at the uh, technical document of how it's done. Great. Thank you, Amita. Question 14. Uh, oh, I, actually, there was something I wanted to add, too, for question 13, because some of you might be using the, uh, the JRC surface water product. And you might see that some of the uh, high latitude and low latitude surface water extents are not available. 
depending on the season. And that is because if the, in some of the high latitude lakes for say in Siberia, uh, they can be frozen over in the winter time in the Northern hemisphere winter. And those, uh, the data would be defined as not available uh, because they don't want to, uh, they don't want to give they don't want to provide data sets that they're not confident where the surface water is. And that just has to do with the seasonality of, of say ice or, or some other seasonal effects. So you might see that when you come across those data sets, but if you dig into the literature then, and we will provide links to all of this, you'll be able to understand why that some of that seasonality might, might be missing uh, when you're going through those data sets. So question number 14, does Hydro Lakes provide a database for all lakes in Asia? If not, which tool provides the same? So Hydro Lakes does provide a database for all the lakes in Asia. Um, so we do encourage you to go there and to uh, access the, the data from, uh, from that website. Question 15, in the JRC data for coastal area water change, have tide effects been considered? Example given, using only high tide or only low tide images to get useful results. I do not have an answer to that, and I will have to go and uh, dig through the literature, uh, and we will, we will come up with that answer and post it here uh, when we do end up posting this to our website. So um, it's a great question, and we will, we, will, we will do our best to answer that and, and provide the literature links when we do. Question 16, is there a method to identify the full tank level, the max water spread, uh, by combining multiple data sets? Hmm. Uh, I'm not aware of um, any product such like that, but, um, I, and we'll have to see if, if it has been looked at that multiple data sets are used to look at the full tank level. But I'm not aware of that. We'll okay, check. Question. Yes, please, Amita. Yeah, no, we'll check about that. Okay, question 17. Which is the level of accuracy of the measurement of res res reservoir heights? Amita? Well, uh, we will see this um, next week that if you lake level height, um, it's it's a few centimeters to about 30, 40 centimeters accuracy. And that, so heights are derived from altimeter, either microwave or laser. And as we talk about that data set, we'll see that uh, accuracy is, it ranges from a few centimeters to a few tens of centimeters. Okay, uh, question. Let's see, uh, question 18. Does the lake data set include coastal lagoons? Uh, for the JRC surface water extent, uh, it does. Uh, but for the, say, hydro lakes, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but for, the, but for the, uh, the surface water extent from JRC, it does. So hydro lakes also considers all the saline lakes and water. So it, um, we'll have to check, but I think it's possible that it includes coastal lagoons. Great, question 19. Is it possible to visualize a lake with uh, two and a half square kilometers of water surface? Um, so I, I think with JRC, it is possible because it is 30 meter square footprint. So in two and a half kilometer square, you will have a few pixels you can look at. Um, mode is also uh, 250 meters square, so maybe just three or four pixels. Um, but uh, not you will not be able to look at uh, lake level heights. You can see the extent. Okay, great. Question 20. How is the water extent calculated during periods of high cloud cover? In some cloudy places, example, given in South America, India, how can we get the monthly variations of the lake extent if optical sensors do not work? Is JRC global surface water data set derived 
from cloud-free data? If not, what is the cloud cover percent used? So uh, the question for the JRC is it's actually both optical and radar data. Uh, as, as this uh, person uh, noted, there's some areas in the tropics that receive high cloud cover uh, throughout all seasons. So uh, when there are cloud-free images, optical imagery is used for the JRC product, but for cloudy images, then uh, the radar uh, imagery is used. So it's a it's a fusion of technique for for both optical and radar. Question twenty one: What happens with Sentinel? Can we use it for delineating? So I believe we answered that question uh, in the first. Uh, so yes, uh, you can use uh, Sentinel one and two, uh, both radar and optical imagery, and you can use that for delineating surface water. Uh, so yes. Question 22. How do you compute the graphs by Peckle et al. 2016, which indicate the in increase and a decrease of the lakes? So uh, that is based on JRC data. So basically, you will have to analyze um, JRC uh, data available either from their explorer or from Google Earth Engine to create those graphs. Okay, great. Thanks, Amita. Question 23. Can we save those area change to asset folder on Google Earth Engine instead of downloading the large files? Uh, can we save, can we save those area change? Okay, to asset folder. So in the, you can, yes. Uh, I think the I think the nature of this question is is can you save them directly to your asset folder, and that is a good question. Uh, I I will look into it. I believe you might have to actually download them first and then upload them to your asset folder. But we will I will have an answer for you and we will post that before we upload this to our website. But that is a good question if you can if you can just download it directly to the asset folder. So we will uh, get an answer to you and and please come back to our website and access this uh, question in a doc in the future, and there you will, you will have your answer. Question 24, is there any algorithm using remote sensing to automatically differentiate natural and artificial lakes? Hmm. So I believe Amita wrote that uh, she's not aware of such an algorithm, but there is a reservoir and dam database available. So a difference between um, uh, you know, reservoir and dams, but in, in terms of an algorithm that we can provide you now, we are not aware of one. So question 25, I would like to ask why you created transition classes with with group by reducer. Thank you very much. Okay, that um, is a good I'm question. A question so. Amita, did you have something to add? No, I'm not sure I understand the question. The the question has to do with the uh, the Earth Engine code and why we created transition classes with group by reducer. And when when we when we wrote the code, that was the what we thought was the best best way to represent the level of analysis and visualization that we were doing. So that was the the logic behind it. But there are uh, there are probably other ways you could go about doing that. But that was the way that we we chose for this demonstration. So question twenty six: How small a reservoir? can be resolved by this tool? And Amita, I believe you just answered this. Yes, so uh, Lancet has 30 square meters of data. If you use Sentinel to MSI, it has 10, 20 meter resolution, but uh, that's one pixel. So depending on how, how big the lake is, uh, you can see from that. 
Okay, question 27. Are JRC data downloads only available in Google Earth Engine? Is there an application like this based on SAR data? So uh, two things. The RSET has provided um, trainings on how to derive surface water uh, with using radar data. So we can certainly post links into that uh, on, on this sheet so you can reference some of those trainings that we've already provided for deriving surface water with uh, using radar data. And then also to address the question involving the JRC data downloads, we will, I, I believe I referenced it earlier, but there is a link directly from uh, JRC, uh, the Joint Research Center, where you can uh, you can download data specific to your region of interest. Uh, it's not, the region of interest is not as well defined as you can do within Google Earth Engine. It is a one by one degree grid. So you would, you might have to do further um, subsetting or processing to get to your region of interest. But the data sets, the raster files are available. All the bands are available that, that you know, we featured in both the Explorer as well as Earth Engine. And we will provide a link to that for those that wanted to use JRC's website to download uh, the one by one degree grid of the bands uh, for, uh, for your uh, study area. So we will certainly provide that. Question 28. Uh, Amita, did you have something to add? Yeah. So uh, the, the question is, which is, which is the sharpest lake surface elevation data in vertical accuracy and temporal return period? So we're going to look at this next week, uh, next session. But my, my answer here is that uh, you will see that uh, the satellite-based lake level heights or elevation data are actually uh, validated with a few lakes. Um, and so accuracy that we see is based on those validation data sets. I mean, there are millions of lakes and reservoirs which are not validated directly. So the recommendation always is that if you are interested in any particular lake, then it always helps to have in situ data and compare with what satellites are showing, these data sets are showing. So what we will talk about is accuracy based on the validation data. So selected lakes, not all lakes. So it is kind of hard to have one answer that, okay, here is the product which has uh, best temporal and um, return period and vertical accuracy. Um, the temporal return period right now, temporal um, monitoring, I think highest is about uh, 10 days for lake levels. So question 29, could you explain the quality of water impact to the accuracy of um, measurements when we use remote sensing approach? I mean, that's a um, great question because for extent, you should, even if it's turbid water or the sediment, you should be able to see that in imagery. Um, when you um, look at lake level height, um, then we're using microwave radar. So um, I, I know that there is um, impact of water quality, especially turbidity and sediments, they affect lake level height, but I will have to let you know precise um, how, what kind of inaccuracies are added because of that. Okay, question 30. I think you said JRC Global Surface Water was available from 1984 to 2019. Is this being continuously updated or is 2019 the last year that data will be available for? It is no. my understanding that the data set will be continuously updated. Yes. They have just not gotten around to updating post 2019. Uh, and I would expect that within, I would say the next, uh, I don't know, the next month, Two year that you I, you would expect that 2020 will be added and will be continuously added going forward. Question 31: Global surface water. 
From the 1990s to 2000s, there was a great area change on regional scale, such as China, in the yearly water history, which is one of the products of, in global surface water. Is it suitable to use the data set before 2000 for the study on regional scales, such as China? So I think the JRC data, um, which goes back to 1984, uh, definitely you can look at that. And the JRC data does have a data product that compares the rate of change from 1984 to 2000 mm -hmm. compared to 2000 to 2019. Yeah, so two. that you can see decadal uh, scale and, and transition from say uh, water to seasonal water or water to no water or even no water to water. So they do have that, that is one of the bands that's provided in the GRC product, and it uses those, uh, those ranges from 84 to 2000 and 2000 to 2019. But it's a, it's, a good con it's a good question because obviously certain areas of the world, specific to countries mainly, uh, have undergone higher rates of change that have impacted different areas of surface water. Uh, yeah. And so it, uh, reflectances can be be used to look at snow, um, and so reflectance are difference between there's a difference between snow and water how they reflect water. So that can help in deciding snow and ice, but no, it's not considered water. And I mean, for the it's not, um, so for lake level height, I don't think if it's covered by ice, you can get that, and also. Uh, extent uh, would, like Sean mentioned, um, in, in higher latitude, which is uh, covered by snow, it would, would not be very accurately delineated. So, so you, yeah, can, I would... you can detect snow and ice from reflectances, but you will not be able to define area that easily. Often. Great, thank you, Nita. Question 33. Is it possible to download the information shown in graphs as an Excel file or .csv, or is it only available on the website? Uh, the question is, you, you can download it, uh, and if you generate them, say, in Earth Engine, Earth Engine gives you the, op the option to, to download as a .csv file or uh, Excel file. So uh, you do have that option if, if this, this uh, this person was, was interested in that. Question 34, how will Sentinel-6 and future satellites improve these lake data sets? Amita? Yeah, so this is what we're going to see next week. So uh, let's hold off because Sentinel-6, of course, is already there. And then SWOT NASA mission also is coming up. Um, so we'll look at those uh, features. Great, and question 35. So can, can we, we measure, measure ocean basins with this technique? So can we measure, so if the, when you say basin, um, uh, so all the altimeter data that we, we're going to talk about, they were first designed to get sea surface height. You know, if they're used for inland lakes and reservoirs, but originally um, it's the ocean level height that was derived starting like there were, way back in 1990s, uh, Tropex Poseidon 1992, to be precise, was launched with the goal of looking at uh, sea surface height. So yes, all these altimeters can provide sea surface height. About uh, basin, um, so if you're talking about whether um, because of sedimentation or runoff or um, if the ocean basins or small um, estuaries are being covered and then the area you want to look at, um, I'm sure that has also been done. Um, and maybe um, GRC data can help with that, looking at uh, extent. But I'm, I'm not aware um, of any, any studies that I can cite right now. Great, question 36. Can I get a reservoir bathymetry information from satellite data in order to calculate the volume of a reservoir? 
Uh, yes, actually, um, last session we'll talk about um, basic metric data from laser altimetry and um, to see how um, you know that can be used. Yes, um, you will see there are some limitations also because there's just one um, one bathymetry information per lake, I, I believe, or lake height. So yes, but uh, at least you have that information from remote sensing. Yes, so many lakes can be seen that way. Great, question 37. Can we use remote sensing in GIS, GIS techniques in estimating sedimentation rate in a lake? Um, I, I believe it depends on the amount of sedimentation, whether, so any remote sensing, optical data, uh, it senses change in reflectance or because of either change in in sedimentation or in in color, that's what is is noted by the satellite. So if it is it is discernible, then yes, you can, I believe. But uh, it has to be done and checked how accurate it is. And question thirty eight. I was wondering if there's any validation for the products we have seen. What is the accuracy of the information? Say water area level volume provided. So again, I think water level uh, we'll definitely talk about next week how, and as I said, yes, all these products are validated. And the thing is that the validation can only be done when there are in situ data available. And so based on that, um, you will see accuracy uh, in, uh, assessment. Uh, so recommendation we always have is that please use this remote sensing data and in your region, if you have a water body and if you can find in situ data, it would be great if you can compare and see if there are biases um, that you can correct or if it's accurate, um, if you look at seasonal or annual variations, do they match? So for any lake, um, validation is not available. So what, what accuracy we will talk about is based on uh, selected validation data available. And in terms of the JRC data set, we will also provide some links that uh, to, to articles that were published in Nature, and they do go into to more detail about how they go about uh, in terms of uh, accuracy assessments and validations, et cetera. So we will certainly add some, uh, some of those links to this, to this document if, you're, if whoever posed this question is interested in following up more. But with that, we are at the top of the, I guess the middle of the hour, 11.33. Uh, we want to thank everybody that joined today. Uh, we saw that there were uh, quite a few of the joined from, from many places all over the world. It was, uh, it was uh, really excited that you were joining. We look forward to having you join us next week where we will be covering introduction and demonstration of water level height data for lakes and reservoirs using radar altimetry. So that is what is going to happen next week. We hope that you will come back and join us then. We have a lot more to share with you, a lot more to uh, information and data to, to dig into. Uh, many, many thanks to, to Amita for providing such an amazing presentation earlier and to all the people working behind the scenes. Uh, that's Brock Levins, Jonathan O'Brien, and Selwyn Hudson-Odoi. Uh, they are from the RSET team. And though you do not see them or hear them, they are working tirelessly to make this so seamless and, and successful. So thank you to everybody involved. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone.